neurodiversity is such a hot topic right now and there are many difficulties, disorders, disabilities that fit under the umbrella term of neurodiversity. There's dyslexia, autism, ADHD, dyscalculia and dyspraxia which is also known as developmental coordination disorder. Through our podcast series we're hoping to shine a light on these different difficulties and I'm so pleased to be speaking with our guest today Professor Amanda Kirby on neurodiversity and developmental coordination disorder and ADHD. Amanda is a qualified GP and worked in adult psychiatry and stress management but she changed her career when her second child was diagnosed with developmental coordination disorder at the age of three. Her experience and frustrations as a parent finding her way around the health and education system led her to start up an interdisciplinary specialist centre for parents and children in Wales more than 25 years ago. Her family is also very neurodiverse or, as Amanda calls it, neurodivergent, which we'll talk about in the show today. Children and adults in her family have a range of diagnoses of dyslexia, autism, developmental coordination disorder, developmental language disorder, ADHD and much more. And this has provided her with a unique understanding, insight and passion that continues to raise awareness and champion best practice, both in education and employment. I'm so thrilled to be talking to Amanda today. Thank you so much for coming on the show, your morning, my evening, Amanda. I'm really uh, excited to be talking to you today. It's lovely to be here. And although there are thousands of miles, it does feel like we're in the same room. So I think that shows the world is a very small place. It certainly does, doesn't it? Um, I've been following you uh, frantically on LinkedIn. I don't know if frantic is the right word, but um, passionately <laughs> probably. Um, and I have been watching you work in um, your work in the neurodiversity space. And so I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you about that today. And um, you have quite an esteemed background. So originally trained as a medic and moved into academia. And now you're an entrepreneur. And I think most importantly, um, a grandparent. Most well. importantly. <laughs> <laughs> most importantly. I think my mum would agree with that. Um, and you have a diverse, neurodiverse family similar to myself. So, and um, a lot of your work is around ADHD and dyspraxia, which is um, one of the re reasons why I was really excited to talk to you because we haven't had the opportunity to talk to anyone around um ADHD or dyspraxia so I'm really excited to find out a bit more about your work so without me talking any further would you be able to give us a little bit of background on yourself and your work? Sure I can so um, great thank you for the introduction and I'm really really pleased to be here with you um, yeah I absolutely come from a very neurodivergent family so I need to start at the beginning in a sense and as I've reflected and learned more over the last 25-30 years I hadn't really thought about how neurodivergent we were because actually our neurodivergent is, is our neurotypical. So I think that's, that's the first thing. We're not diverging, we're all typical of each other. So, uh, and we have children and adults um, it, over generations who are, have spiky profiles, who have diagnoses and labels, but actually 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, no labels because people didn't recognize, just thought you were a bit of an oddball or you were really quirky or you're really brilliant at science or really musical. So we have a really spiky profile family going from uh, musicians, academics, scientists, but we also have people in our family who are nonverbal, um, epileptic, uh, learning disabled, so we have the spikiness of spikiness. So we, if you want to do a genetic study, and actually I married a neurodivergent family as well. So, <laughs> so not surprisingly, some of my children are neurodivergent, some of my grandchildren are neurodivergent as well, <laughs> but actually it's our typical. So that's fine. So I think that's the first thing. And really it was only because I was a GP and my middle child was diagnosed and with dyspraxia or developmental coordination disorder that my, my journey changed. So I've been working in paediatrics and also in adult psychiatry. And I realized that I needed help and support. I needed practical guidance to know how to help him in education. I wasn't a, a formal educator at that time and had to navigate my way through the health and educational system to get him the right support. And I realized that as a parent, I wasn't alone. 
and talking to lots of other parents, they were going through similar things. And often the things that were helpful for me were the practical suggestions that parents often had that, oh, I've tried this, this is useful. Or when I pack his bag, I do this. Or when we sit down to do homework, I do that. And that was really important because I recognized that sometimes getting the diagnosis wasn't the answer, that actually it was the start of a conversation, not the end of a conversation. And the support you need is over, well, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, because things change and you change and you grow up. So I started um, stupidly in a sense, or naively, I should say, not stupidly, but naively, to set up an interdisciplinary centre with health and educational professionals under one roof. And that ended up being a research and clinical centre. And I developed research in the field because there's very little around that. And I think I was thought of as an oddball 25, 30 years ago. What is she doing? You know, But now transdisciplinary working, interdisciplinary working is something that everybody wants to do. And I talked about neurodevelopmental pathways and people thought looked at me very strangely, but actually that's the language that people are talking about. So neurodiversity has been in my blood for a long time. And then when it came to the um, tech stuff, I thought, how do we get this out to more people? So it's, it's crazy that, for instance, you might have to wait three years to get an ADHD diagnosis. And as a parent, I need some help with sleep, behavior, uh, sitting down at the table to have a meal time together, using cutlery, doing shoelaces, and you shouldn't have to wait three years to get practical information. So then I've developed some screening tools that are person-centered, and we've developed those over the last 10 years. Again, 10 years ago, I was thought of as an oddball. <laughs> <laughs> what is she doing? You know? But actually, yeah, I'm, I think less of an oddball now, or I'm proud of being an oddball, and I'd still want to remain an oddball. So I think that's a, a rapid, and the tools we use are used in prison and education and in uh, apprenticeships, and we're just launching a parent one for parents to be able to use with really practical guidance, going back to harping 30 years behind, but for, you know, back, which is what I, what did I need? What did I need? So that's being launched now. So I'm very excited about that. I think um, less of an oddball and maybe more of a trailblazer is the right. <laughs> I like the right. <laughs> I'm good. I think it's a good, you know why not celebrate the <laughs> this spikiness in all of us, you know, and the variability in all of us. And I think about my grandson who is brilliant at maths. I mean, amazing, uh, incredible at Minecraft. He's only six. You know, he's got some great talents. But he's got some spiky bits where he needs some help and support. But, you know, who do we need? We need scientists and we need mathematicians and we need, you know, computer programmers, all sorts of things. So he's got the right skills. We just need to not see that he needs to do handwriting mm. because that yeah. just seems crazy that we're making people do things they don't need to do. And it's interesting that you say in your family you're all neurodivergent, but you're all neurotypical. And that's how your family is because mine's very much the same. And my partner always says to me, we're all neurodiverse though. We're all different. None, uh -uh. none of us are the same. And so we're always having this debate within my family. And it's always when we are all different and how, what do we, how do we help people when that difference is impacting them day to day? Yes. And, and I think that's very important. We mustn't, you know, because sometimes I hear people who are neurodiverse are superheroes, you know, and I think we've got to be careful about the language we use in that way in some ways, because for some people, their challenges are profound and they're impacting on everyday ability to be active and participate. And part of my championing is training and teaching and, and really trying to think of inclusive processes, whether that's in school or in the workplace. But at the same time, some people, a bit like you're diabetic, if you change the environment, you're still diabetic, right? So if you're epileptic, you're still epileptic. So even though we can think about inclusive processes, for some people, their challenges are true and they're real and we need to recognise them and support that individual, uh, really. So I think we shouldn't just think of it's all great and it's all superpowers because I also see you know, many children who get excluded from school because they can't focus and attend, that they're disruptive in the classroom because they don't understand, you know, that they're frustrated because they can't record their information down on paper. And, and those are real things and they're real things and you can't play football and join in with the others, you know, because nobody wants you to be in their team. And I, I, I just think that we have to really 
understand the impact of that on a child or adult's life, short and long term? It's, um, I really, I'm really pleased you raised that point because we talk a lot about that in the research I'm doing at the moment. I'm hoping to write a paper on the, the labelling of superpower or disability within the Australian context and what adults, how adults see those words and what, what that means to them. But mm. I, I'm not going to sidetrack us on that, on that on my research. <laughs> um, there's a couple of questions. One, could you, um, for some of our listeners that might not have a good understanding of dyspraxia or developmental coordination disorder, difficult is that we've trans yep. we don't use that language as much in Australia. We're starting to transition to that. But also a little bit around ADHD and ADD and what what you've seen okay. and worked with. Okay. So um, developmental coordination disorder is the international term which describes the core of it is motor difficulties that are, uh, are present in uh, and, and impact on that person's life in all aspects of their life and, and impact on their ability to be active and participate. So I always use a, a dear colleague of mine, David Sugden, who's no longer alive, but was my mentor, always used to say, think about, take a day in the life of, of you and what doesn't require coordination. So when you get up this morning, go to bed tonight, and you think of everything in your day that might need fine motor coordination or balance sitting on a chair or walking up the stairs or pouring a drink or brushing your hair or using cutlery, you can start to see that motor is everywhere. And DCD is the international name, as I said, and it's been called different things. So in the 1970s, 80s, we used to talk about the clumsy child syndrome. Um, words have changed over time. It is dyspraxia is the word that has come to be used to be interchangeable. And I really don't understand why dyspraxia got, it was stuck, but I think it's because of dyslexia. So people went dyslexia, dyspraxia, and you can be dyslexic and dyspraxic, but you can't be dcd -ic. So I wonder whether that's a language again, right? Drives yes. behavior. But actually dyspraxia, the term came from the brain injury literature. So it was about praxis and planning and if we had more time, I would go into that further. But what it's so it started to be used in that way to be interchangeable now. So and some places are using DCD. So DCD is the uh, international term and it's and most of the research is done around DCD because it is defined. So if people are doing research, they've got a definition of neat definition of what it is, how it's measured, whereas dyspraxia is ill defined and variably defined. Right. OK. Yeah. Um, that's so it's know. lifelong, it's lifelong, it's common, three to five percent of children, 70 percent of adults in the UK, we have about one million adults with DCD. Uh, so we know it's common, it's continuous, it co-occurs, so and it's uh, and it and it impacts on people's lives. So although you have the motor bit, you also have the non-motor elements like planning and organization, and it impacts on things like self-esteem and confidence. And lots of people with DCD have much raised anxiety. And some of the some of the great research has been done in Australia. You've got key researchers who've worked in the field of DCD, like Jan Peake um, from Curtin University, has done a lot of the work. You've got you've got um, you've got people in Melbourne as well at RMIT as well. Peter Wilson, Professor Peter Wilson. So go and go and knock on their doors and talk to them about it because you've got some really great people who are doing the work. And then when it comes to ADHD, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, we're talking about two to three percent of the population. Um, in the UK, we're very cautious about diagnosing, so people often go, "Oh, it's overdiagnosed," and so many people have got it. But actually, we're really cautious and, and, and in the methodology to give a diagnosis. Um, AD, ADD, attention deficit disorder, comes underneath ADHD, under the umbrella. And people will have a variable presentation. So they might have difficulties, challenges. I haven't talked about strengths. So I'll come back to strengths in DCD and strengths in ADHD. Because the diagnosis of both is, at the moment, based on what you can't, not what you can, okay? Mm -hmm. That's not my framing, okay? That's just how it is at the moment. So ADHD, um, you have difficulties with focus and attention. Some people might be more impulsive, might get bored very easily. So the bits that are really interesting or oh, focus on, but then the bits that are less interesting, really hard to stay focused on. Can be impulsive, so um, answer out of turn, full of ideas in your head and you've got to get them out and you can't wait. Um, so sometimes think acting without thinking, 
Uh, there's an impact on time management. So some people have what's called time blindness. So not be have an uh, understanding of time passing. So if somebody says, you need to be ready in 10 minutes, your child's still sitting at the end of the bed, or you need to complete this work in the next five minutes, doesn't mean it's five ogledies, doesn't mean anything, right? So time blindness, so executive functioning, planning, organization, time management is often a challenge. It is with DCD and it is with ADHD and DCD and ADHD, not surprisingly, overlap, okay? <laughs> often, so 30 often. to 40% of children will have both. And dyslexia is in the mix and dyscalculia is in the mix and developmental languages in the mix and autism spectrum disorders in the mix and Tourette syndrome's in the mix. Mm. So um, ADHD and Tourette's often overlap. Um, so these are each person, we're going back to neurodiversity, everybody's different. And most children and adults I see are never pure anything. They're, it just depends who's given them the diagnosis, the label they've actually got. And so have you seen, because um, from the research I've read, that's around one third of people with dyslexia will have ADHD. Is, there, is that a similar kind of statistic with OC, OOD? ODD like, or OCD? <laughs> OCD. Two different, no, two not different o, definitely not so, OCD. <laughs> Developmental coordination disorder. I get my letters oh, back. PCD. PCD. Yeah. So, <laughs> a, well, well, ADHD and OCD um, uh, do overlap, and ADHD and ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, overlap. Okay. <laughs> ADHD and DCD overlap 30 to 40% of the time. Dyslexia and, and um, DCD overlap. Dyslexia and ADHD overlap, but they all overlap with each other. Mm. Okay, that's really important. And they all overlap often. I think that's the headline. Co-occurrence is the rule rather than this exception. And that if you have a diagnosis of one, you may not have the full shebang to get the diagnosis. So I use an analogy of balls in the bucket. So that if you have a blue balls for dyslexia and red balls for DCD and yellow balls for ADHD and green balls for DLD, you have to have so many balls to reach a threshold to get a diagnosis. So say we say arbitrarily five balls, any, any one color gets you the diagnosis. Now, reality is, A, the diagnosis you get is dependent on the professional you see, and B, we may only be screening for one color ball, mm. right? So mm -hmm. the fact that you haven't got it may just be a factor that somebody hasn't looked for it. And also your yellow balls may not be five, so significant enough to get a diagnosis, but you might have features of ADHD. So you might have some attention challenges and have a diagnosis of dyslexia, or you might have fine motor difficulties with handwriting and a diagnosis of dyslexia, right? Mm. And then you sometimes see children getting a diagnosis of dysgraphia because the whole picture hasn't been looked at properly. So I was diagnosed with dysgraphia and I, I've heard that that's not really a term used so much in the UK now, it's DCD. Now I had to write that down because as you can see, I'm getting my acronyms all mixed up. Not surprised. It's a, it's not <laughs> so I've surprised. written it to make sure I get it right. But you don't really use that term anymore. So no. should we not but I think it's, ina it's inaccurate, I think. That's the problem, you know, because I, it's about our terms need to mean something to target the support for the child or the adult. And if they are, if it is, you know, it's a bit like mixing up blue and red and, and a bit of purple and you get brown every time, you don't know what's in the mixture to get to the brown, right? Mm. So giving a diagnosis of dysgraphia doesn't help me to say, how do I help John, Jan, Jim, right? So it's not a useful term. And dysgraphia is a clustered term, partly meaning dyslexia, partly meaning handwriting difficulties, partly meaning difficulties with, with um, thinking of words and getting them down on paper, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's the point is that recording is a function of a number of different things of which fine motor is only one part. You've got visual spacing, so you've got to have spacing, so you need to understand the spacing. You need to be thinking about the words and generating the words and the meaning, so it's about that. It's about recording those actions down onto paper and, and not losing focus along the way, because you're so busy making the shape of A, you've lost the content, so that's gone out the window. And now, oh, now I can see a bird out in the garden, right? <laughs> yeah, so dysgraphia in itself, I don't think is a really useful term. And so has that been absorbed into DCD now? 
Well, do you, just what, it, how, what's hap- where does that term go? I think it should go. It should I, go. I think it should go because <laughs> the, ultimately the best term is the term that helps you. And that isn't a term. That is terms. That is descriptors that describe your strengths and challenges. Because if we say all of this overlaps and one child will have... So with dyslexia, not everybody has reading, spelling, writing, reading, comprehension problems, phonics. Yep, they'll have a different pattern. Mm -hmm. And to help that, so if we do the same thing to everybody, we're wasting a hell of a lot of time. If we understand where your challenges are, so it's a bit like if I have problems kicking a ball and you keep getting, and it's my right foot, and you keep getting me to kick it with my left foot, we're going to waste a hell of a lot of time doing that, right? Whereas actually, if you know it's my right foot, we'll concentrate on my right foot, and then I can start kicking the ball. Right. So, you know, so I think that's important that we become more person centered and not label led. A label never describes a person. It's mm. a short descriptor to describe a group of traits that are, have some commonality, I suppose. Um, it'd be great to talk to you at another point around dysgraphia and where does it, if it doesn't, ex- if the term should go, where does it sit or does it sit well, it anymore? Sits- or- well, it sits, it doesn't sit neatly because it sits mm. across DCD, dyslexia and DLD. And DLD <laughs> used to be speech language impairment, speech language communication needs, speech language communication impairments, and then it got changed to DLD. So, you know, this is, we could have a whole hour on <laughs> we acronyms could. and how they change. And we? the DSM-5 and how that, every time it changes, it throws, creates a whole new challenge with labels and diagnosis and... Absolutely. But, Anyway, we won't um, we won't digress today. My other um, question was: Could you uh, just, if possible, briefly describe the difference between neurodiversity and neurodivergence? Because we, at the moment, we don't use neurodivergence as much in Australia. We, it's it's the neurodiversity okay. movement, which encompasses everything you just spoke about, really. Absolutely. So, well, so I think the first thing is neurodiversity doesn't mean autism. That's the first thing, right? And sometimes it's used interchangeably to mean autism, mm. and it doesn't. Neurodiversity, if you think about it, and obviously Judy Singer coming from Australia was the sociologist who started talking about it, but she was talking about it as a sociologist, okay? That neurodiversity is the diversity of everybody's cognition, right? The way we see, communicate, hear, understand, move, and the variability of all of us. We've got billions of brain cells, so why wouldn't we be variable? You know, we've got shades of height, shades of hair color, shades of eye color, shades of everything. And why do we put uh, people with some challenges into like six boxes? It's extraordinary, right? So neurodiversity means all of us. That's the first thing. It has been used as an umbrella term um, under which we put some traits associated with specific conditions like dyslexia, DCD, ADHD, DLD, the ones we've been talking about. Now, neurodiversity, so when we're talking about neurodivergence, we're really talking about a a normal distribution graph, right? If we think about height, you've got people who are of average height in the middle, and you've got some people who are shorter and some people are taller. And when we're talking about neurodivergence, we're talking about divergence from the normal distribution. As I said, very, I said it, I meant it. I come from a neurotypical family because in my family, we the average is us <laughs> right <laughs> so i don't believe i've diverged from anything you know i think i'm absolutely typical so it does depend on the um, society you're in whether you are deemed to diverge right and actually we and also we don't just diverge or not this is in a we want a 4d sort of thing because i might um, be really good at maths so if I think of my, about my grandchild really good at maths so he diverges and he's like you know he's year two but he's in he's got year six maths but his handwriting is pre-year one right so that that's a typical diverging one way and diverging the other way <laughs> yeah and in yeah. the middle he sits in the middle with a lot of stuff which is neurotypical mm. of his class okay so that's what we're talking about now some people don't like the term diverging because it's got sort of uh connotations or you know and i think the important thing is every person needs to use the language that they feel comfortable with but what we need to see is that neurodiversity does not mean equals autism i think that we need to move that one along really yeah yeah definitely and i think that's 
I mean, it's been great, I think, in starting the conversation around, yeah. particularly for the workplace, around yeah. Um, yeah. diversity of difference. But, um, yes, it definitely doesn't equal autism. <laughs> and there's a lot of us sitting under that umbrella term at the moment. Yeah, exactly. So we just need to question that. And neurodiversity also, uh, neurodivergence also means people with cerebral palsy, it means people with stroke, it means people who are visually impaired, people who are hearing impaired, right? It it, it, it does mean, we. nobody says it's only these people. Who determines that? Because mm. our cognitive differences are our cognitive differences. You don't say you can be in the club, but you can't because <laughs> your brain differences are not in the club that we want you to be in, right? That yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. And I didn't really want to be in, in any club. <laughs> and then when we started to. being putting into, we were starting to be put into the neurodiversity club. And uh, what worries me is, um, which we touched on a little bit before, is that it starts to water down then the actual difficulties that people are having because they try to um, say, well, we're going to teach neurodiversity to the workplace and it's, it's everyone. But there's certain subgroups within that everyone that actually need additional support or help. And that is my fear when I see some of the, the um, language coming through and the conversation is that if we water it down, then people won't get the support that they really need. So I think that we have facts and information are really important. And where we're saying neurodiversity is everywhere, we're also saying some people do diverge and it is and are excluded. And we can say that, you know, uh, 80% of people who are disabled, you know, disabled by their workplace, have non-visible, invisible, hidden impairments that challenge them on a day-to-day -day basis. And until we get to a point in the workplace where you don't have to disclose, because I think disclosing is revealing, it's sharing, it can cause shame, it can cause concern. I was talking to somebody over LinkedIn over the weekend who brilliant woman who got into a job and was doing a job and disclosed and then was sacked 10 days later after that oh, wow. with no assistance yeah now until we feel confident that when we say um i have adhd traits or i have dyslexia traits or i have a diagnosis of dyslexia however we want we want to frame it and it feels safe to do so um it still stays on the on the table and it, you know in the end let's have an inclusive workplace that is equitable, not equal. Mm. I use those words carefully, that's equitable, which means everybody's needs are met, not according to label, but according to need and according to you as a person. I have a beautiful image of um, equitable that we use at my workplace and it's, it's a great representation of how we make it an even playing field for everybody. Yeah. So talking of the workplace, how can we encourage them to see um, people's strengths, uh, whether it's ADHD or dyslexia or any neurodivergence? And what are some ways that we can start to shift the thinking, do you think, um, within the workplace to look at a strength-based approach rather than this deficit model that we're so used to? So I think the first thing is, is um, we know that businesses that uh, think about neurodiversity do better. They have higher rates of productivity. They have higher retention rates. They have greater well-being of their workforce and their customers see that they're valued. So there's a couple of things here. One is hiring for talent. Don't pity somebody to take them on for a job. Take them on because they are talented and they've got the skills to do so. But they might have support needs like anyone else, training needs, right? So all of us will have skills gaps. All of us will have training needs. And it's your responsibility as an employer to make sure that you support that person so they can use their talents effectively. So hire for talent. Hire, see that um, we know that about and, and you'll see greater productivity. The other thing is, as it's a it's as a anybody running a business that the, the purple pound or the purple dollar is worth a lot, right? And actually, if you're turning away people because your systems, your processes are not accessible, you'll not only be losing talent that won't come into your workplace because they'll go somewhere else. They won't see that you're inviting. They won't apply for jobs where you could have somebody with new and great solutions. Also, your customers will be turning away too. And so that's got a value. So actually an inclusive, accessible process is effective for you to grow your customer base if you're customer facing. It's useful for productivity, it's useful for well-being. And I do think that neurodiversity is about inclusion, equity, and well-being. 
And I think, you know, now more than ever, during post this awful set stage in our lives, um, well-being has to be at the fore. And if you take that, you will have a happier, more productive workforce as well. So looking at well-being, if we flip it and how do we support people to see their strengths? Because a lot of yeah. us have gone through a lot of trauma or we've been told we can't do things or we're constantly behind the eight ball. So how do we, um, without making it into a superpower, how yeah. can we um, show people that they do have strengths, even if they've come from a really challenging place? So I think there's a couple of things. One, we need to start earlier. So, and we have to, we've talked a lot about language in this conversation, mm. but, the, but we, we, we have to reframe, you know, we know now that people, and it's not a surprise, but we focus very much on what you can't do, not what you can do. And a strengths-based approach really young with younger children is important to build self-esteem and to work on those and focus on those things that people are motivated, interested, and they've got more skills in. However, challenging you are, you will be better at some things than others, right? So that's the first thing. So we need to seek out strengths in young people so we build resilience and they can see strengths in themselves. And that's a language we've got to use rather than a deficit disorder language, yep. So that's the first thing. In adults, we've got to do the same in a way, which is you may be thinking about all the things you can't do, but let's, let's just talk about and find out the things that you can do. Now we know that some people with dyslexia are entrepreneurial, but not all are, you know, so we've got to be careful to go, everybody who's dyslexic is entrepreneurial. You know, everybody who's dyspraxic is empathic. We know that more people with DCD are empathic, you know, have higher rates of empathy, but not everyone, right? So again, person-centered. And I, I, I worked, you know, ran a clinical service for years. And one of the things I would always work on, what do you like? What, what are you interested in? What are you motivated in? Let's, and that was a route in to seeing where there might be skills and strengths because there was something that somebody was more interested in, right? Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, if I'm a, a poker player on the weekend, I want to be a professional poker player <laughs> or, I, or I, you know, bake chocolate muffins that I want to be a baker. But it might tell me that I enjoy things with my hands. So hearing that, what is it about it you like about that, right? Is it that you're working with somebody else? You know, is it that you're you're liking the, the textures and, you know, so what is it about it that you like? And I've seen people work with animals and then go on to work with animals, you know, in their adult life because of an interest in that. It might lead them somewhere else. So I remember with my son, he was interested in animals and he went to do um, a, a course with uh, animal care course when he was younger. He doesn't work with animals now, but it was a route into finding where his strengths were. Yeah, I think it's, um, I'd like your point about starting young and trying to build that resilience. And I think we're now in an environment where we know so much more than compared to say when I was growing up. There's no excuse now for us not to be, to be starting young and supporting children to become really healthy, fulfilled adults. Yeah, and that's about seeking strengths. And, and, and you know, sometimes you have, it's a, you have to try a few things, you know. You know, I've found sometimes people say, oh, we tried that, didn't work. We tried that, didn't work. We just, you know, so there's a bit of, oh, he doesn't like that. But sometimes I've realised that maybe that your child isn't developmentally ready to do something. And then two or three years later, you reintroduce you yoga or judo or playing a ball game. Or, and, you know, and then it's brilliant. My son growing up, we went, used to go, my husband loves skiing. We used to go skiing on a regular basis. And my son at, at a younger age, oh my goodness, he hated it. He <laughs> sat there and he sat on the floor and he wasn't going to move. And now he's in his 30s if we said go skiing he'd be the first out the door he loves it right <laughs> absolutely loves it he's the most fanatical skier out of all of us so it does say that sometimes it's an age and a stage and it's like all of us you know sometimes we have to try it again later on and see whether it's for us you know so I think don't give up and go well we've done that we've done that um I think that's important it's, it's a long journey <laughs> Got it lots is a of long journey try out things <laughs> Um, and it doesn't go away, but it can improve. <laughs> yes, it can. It can. Yeah, it or, can improve. A, I think as an adult, sorry, sorry, I apologize. Um, I think as an adult, uh, the good thing is, well, hopefully the good thing is you can choose what you want to do. 
So in school, you have to do every subject. I was useless at history, could never, and there's those days you had to remember dates, right? I couldn't remember a date to save my life. Uh, 1066, that was about it. That was, that was my only date I could ever remember. <laughs> Uh, but so I don't have to do history now, you know, and some of the things that you have to do in school where you have to do everything. The beauty as an adult is you can choose, hopefully, and that's where good careers guidance and, and support things you are better at and and avoid less or do less of the things that you find more challenging. So that, that things do improve, can improve. Yeah, it's a, I found it's a fine balance. I've ended up in most of my roles, everything's required writing, and that is my, my weak point. <laughs> so, but it has improved. It has improved with time and yeah, learning new strategies. Text. Yeah, speech to text software, you know, mm -hmm. text to speech software, using things like immersive reader, grammar checkers, spell checkers. Technology is really helping, isn't it, for some things? Definitely, I def I would not be where I am today without technology. Even just finding my way around. I'm a terrible navigator, as my listeners know. <laughs> I get lost <laughs> all the time. So thank goodness for Google Maps. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been um, so wonderful talking to you today, Amanda. Are there any key points that you'd like to leave our listeners, either if it's parents that have children with DCD or, or as we use in Australia at the moment, still dyspraxia? or ADHD or any adults that might have um, one of those two divergences? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think if you're a parent of a child, uh, think about what's going to be important um, as your child grows up and don't worry about the sweat. Don't worry about some stuff that's not going to be right. So sometimes we worry about everything. And I think that if you're a parent or a child, things like helping with planning and organization is going to be useful for life. So, you know, even if it is, if you're a child sorting your clothes into colors, you know, or, or putting them into socks and tops and, and, you know, into items, we can start with organizational skills at a very young age. That will only benefit a child and an adult. So you, you're doing no harm, right? So colored stickers and using, using calendars and visual calendars, useful for all of us. So that's the, that is a commonality between DCD and ADHD help with planning and organization. For both groups, because often they'll overlap anyway, I think fitness is really useful because um, fatigue is something that often people complain of and sleep yeah. disturbance is a commonality yeah. as well. So building exercise, opportunities for exercise that you take pleasure in and finding the exercise that you take pleasure in is important if you're a child or a parent and it gives you opportunities for improving your endorphins and helping you focus and helping you sleep. So I think um, be fit, eat healthily and help with planning an organization. And don't worry if you can't use a pencil sharpener, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry about things. And if you can't tie shoelaces, there is Velcro and there are elastic yeah. shoelaces. So, you know, don't worry about some of that stuff. Worry about the things that are going to have the greatest impact and friendships. And do you find that um, children with DCD fearful of doing physical activity because of their coordination yeah. problems? Is there, yeah. Are there any strategies for parents around how they could help build their confidence and self-esteem? Because yeah. exercise, as you said, is extremely important on a number of different levels. Yeah. So some of the some of the research that came from Australia in uh, three to four year olds showing that they're, even at that sort of age, they would have um, increased levels of anxiety compared to uh, children who didn't have DCD. So and we think that is because of fear of climbing on a climbing frame, you know, not being able to catch and throw a ball. So what we know is a little and often makes a difference. So it's got to be fun. So that's really important, okay? So things that are fun, you need to do a group of things together. So not just kicking a ball back and forth, kicking a ball back and forth, the same ball. So if it is ball skills, big balls, little balls, sitting down, lying down, kicking, so, but all around ball skills. So, um, and, and often, so 10 minutes every day, short and often so not killing the child with you know oh my god we're doing that again variety is really important so it's not boring and fun is important i keep going back <laughs> fun is important and we know that um, sports like uh swimming badminton archery uh, martial arts uh using the gym uh you know uh, canoeing right can be really successful so it's finding something that your child enjoys 
uh, team ball sports often are are less hard. easy to do and harder to do. <laughs> yes. I'm sure I've got a few. My my kindergarten teacher, the first sign that there might be something uh, that I might be having some challenges was actually on the play equipment. And she said to my mum, I was extremely clumsy. And I've always been extremely clumsy and terrible at board, ball sports. So um, I think they're really good strategies to help help um, children build their confidence and self-esteem. Yeah, and I think to recognise that, you know, many of us are functioning adults and we don't play football. No. So, you know, again, what's important, you know, swimming's important because swimming is a survival skill as well, you know. Mm. So, but I, I do think that we don't need to get so worried about your child's playing football or not playing football. Getting fit and keeping fit, yeah, absolutely, really important. But we get a bit obsessed because that's the neurotypical sport, and it doesn't mean it's the right sport for you. And most adults don't play team games. So it's an interesting one, isn't it, really? Yeah. Why we drive that and we have that as a sort of champion of champions when actually most of us don't do it as adults. No, and it, yeah, because it's so it's enforced in schools, <laughs> especially where I went. We had to play a sport and it was normally a team sport. Yeah. And yeah. You were, you were, I was normally benched until the last five minutes where they could work out whether we were going to win or lose. <laughs> And then I was allowed on the court. <laughs> so that doesn't give you much exercise, does it? So no. you could have been swimming for that hour, couldn't you? You know, and yeah. been doing more exercise. I know yeah. it's, it's but it is about group activities because when ed education often is about how do we do things as a group because we've got one teacher and 30 children. So we have to do things that divide them into two parts so, so we can manage it. So it's about management, you know, it's it's, it's not about the child, it's about managing groups of of individuals yeah which is in some ways is good because as you grow into becoming an adult a lot of workplaces you need to be able to work with as a team but it yeah it takes away that um looking at the individual child doesn't it and what are their strengths and how can you play to those yeah and actually even in the team when you're playing football somebody you might not need to be the participant you could be the referee you mm. know so you know in a team we want different people with different strengths it doesn't mean we all have to run around. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, a great message um, to finish on tonight. It's been wonderful talking to you. I've learned so much and I'm perplexed with what I'm going to do with all our information on dysgraphia, but I, um, it's really good to have a conversation around it and to learn from you. So thank you so much for your time. I really, really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Please stay well in Wales. Thank and you, I will, and you as well in Melbourne. <laughs> thank you. I um, look forward to following more of your work on LinkedIn and um, sharing it with our community. So thank you again, Amanda, for your time. Thank you very much. To find out more about Amanda and all her work, head to deardyslexic.com. Did you know we now have a new live Q&A series called Question Dis, D-Y-S, created during COVID to help our community feel more connected. Each month, I interview a fellow dyslexic about all things dyslexia and life. The Question Dis series is running through Facebook Live. I really hope you can come along and join us for one of these sessions. If you haven't already done so yet, make sure you sign up to our mailing list so you can keep up to date with everything we do at the Foundation. Head to deardyslexic.com. And don't forget, if there is anything you have heard today that was distressing, please call Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36 or Lifeline on 13 11 14. If there is a topic you would like discussed on the show, please email us, admin at ddyslexic.com. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.